Come follow me reading April 28th, 22nd through the 28th. Filled with love towards God and all men. Mosiah 1 through 3. When you hear the word king, you might think of crowns, servants, and thrones. In Mosiah 1 through 3, you will read about a different kind of king. Rather than living off the labors of his people, King Benjamin labored with his own hands. Instead of having others to serve him, he served people with all the might, mind, and strength which the Lord had granted unto him. This king did not want his people to worship him. Rather, he taught them to worship their heavenly king, Jesus Christ. King Benjamin understood that it is the Lord Omnipotent who reigneth, who came down from heaven and went forth amongst men, that salvation might come unto the children of men, even through faith on his name. From the manual. Introduction. Benjamin became king following the reign of his father, Mosiah, who led the Nephites from the land of Nephi to the land of Zarahemla. With the aid of other holy prophets, King Benjamin established peace through the land in his day. At the beginning of the book of Mosiah, King Benjamin is nearing the end of his illustrious life. His final sermon is the one of, was one of the most stirring and significant sermons in the Book of Mormon. With the assistance of the holy prophets who were among his people, King Benjamin labored with all the might of his body and the faculty of his whole soul to establish peace in the land. Near the end of his life, Benjamin called the people together at the temple. During this assembly, he reported on his reign as king, appointed his son Mosiah to succeed him, taught concerning Christ's gospel and atonement, and exhorted the Nephites to take upon themselves the name of Jesus Christ. The portion of Benjamin's address discussed in this chapter of the manual demonstrates the ideals he espoused, Willingness to serve others, gratitude for divine providence, and dependence upon the Savior. We can grow in humility and strengthen our covenant relationship with God by living according to the principles King Benjamin taught. From the Book of Mormon. The Book of Mosiah, Chapter 1. King Benjamin teaches his sons the language and prophecies of their fathers. Their religion and civilization have been preserved because of the records kept on the various plates. Mosiah is chosen as king and is given custody of the records and other things about 130 to 124 BC. And now there was no more contention in all the land of Zarahemla among all the people who belonged to King Benjamin, so that King Benjamin had continual peace all the remainder of his days. And it came to pass that he had three sons, and he called their names Mosiah and Helaram and Helaman. And he caused that they should be taught in all the language of his fathers that thereby they might become men of understanding, and that they might know concerning the prophecies which had been spoken by the mouths of their fathers, which were delivered them by the hand of the Lord. From the Student Manual, Mosiah 1, 1 1-2 A shift from the first-person account of the first books of the Book of Mormon to the third-person account of Mosiah. Quote, Note that the main story in the book of Mosiah is told in the third person rather than in the first person, as was the custom in the earlier books of the Book of Mormon. The reason for this is that someone else is now telling the story, and that someone else is Mormon. With the beginning of the book of Mosiah, we start our study of Mormon's abridgment of various books that had been written on the large plates of Nephi. The book of Mosiah and the five books that follow, Alma, Helaman, 3rd Nephi, 4th Nephi, and Mormon, were all abridged or condensed by Mormon from the large plates of Nephi. And these abridged versions were written by Mormon on the plates that bear his name, the plates of Mormon. From the scriptures. And he also taught them concerning the records which were engraven on the plates of brass, saying, My sons, I would that ye should remember that were it not for these plates which contain these records and these commandments, we must have suffered in ignorance, even at this present time not knowing the mysteries of God. For it were not possible that our father Lehi could have remembered all these things, to have taught them to his children, except it were for the help of these plates. For he, having been taught in the language of the Egyptians, therefore he could read these engravings, and teach them to his children, that thereby they could teach them to their children, and so fulfilling the commandments of God, even down to this present time. I say unto you, my sons, were it not for these things which have been kept and preserved by the hand of God, that we might read and understand of his mysteries, and have his commandments always before our eyes, that even our fathers would have dwindled in unbelief. And we should have been like unto our brethren the Lamanites, who know nothing concerning these things, or even do not believe them when they are taught them, because of the traditions of their fathers, which are not correct. 
O oh, my sons, I would that ye should remember that these sayings are true, and also that these records are true. And behold also the plates of Nephi, which contain the records and the sayings of our fathers, from the time they left Jerusalem until now. And they are true. And we can know of their surety because they have them before our because we have them before our eyes. From the manual. Mosiah one four through six, the language of the Egyptians. Benjamin, Nephi, and Moroni all refer to the Egyptian language. In Mosiah one, four through six, King Benjamin makes it clear there was a reason his sons needed to learn the language of the Egyptians. It was necessary in order to study the commandments contained on the brass plates and the plates of Nephi. From the time of Nephi down to Moroni, the Nephites had a form of the Egyptian language. From the scriptures. And now, my sons, I would that ye should remember to search them diligently, that ye may profit thereby. And I would that ye should keep the commandments of God, that ye may prosper in the land according to the promises which the Lord made unto our fathers. And many more things did King Benjamin teach his sons, which are not written in this book. From the Come Follow Me Manual. Mosiah 1, verses 1-7. through 7. Search the scriptures diligently. In these verses, notice how the sacred records blessed King Benjamin's people. How is your life better because you have the scriptures? Back to the scriptures. And it came to pass that after King Benjamin had made an end of teaching his sons, that he waxed old, and he saw that he must very soon go the way of all the earth. Therefore he thought it expedient that he should confer the kingdom upon one of his sons. Therefore he had Mosiah brought before him, and these are the words which he spake unto him, saying, My son, I would that ye should make a proclamation throughout all this land among all this people, or the people of Zarahemla, and the people of Mosiah who dwell in the land, that thereby they may be gathered together. For on the morrow I shall proclaim unto this my people out of mine own mouth that thou art a king and a ruler over this people, whom the Lord our God hath given us. From the manual. Mosiah 1, 3 through 10, Mysteries of God. The term mysteries of God, as used in the Book of Mormon, includes the saving principles of the gospel of Jesus Christ. They are termed mysteries, not because they are mysterious or difficult to understand, but because they are revealed from God. Based upon our faith and obedience, they are attended to lead God's children to eternal life. Quote, a mystery is a truth that cannot be known except through divine revelation, a sacred secret. In our day, such great truths as those pertaining to the restoration of the priesthood, the work for the dead, and the re-establishment of the church are mysteries, because they could not have been discovered except by revelation. End quote. Mosiah 1, 10. Mosiah to be the new king. A close examination of the Book of Mormon re reveals numerous traditions and customs that have their origins in ancient Israel. There is a striking similarity between Mosiah's ascendancy to the Nephite throne in the first chapters of Mosiah and how kings were crowned in the Old Testament. Some noticeable <clears throat> similarities between the Book of Mormon and Old Testament coronation ceremonies include 1. A belief that kings were chosen by heaven. 2. The sanctuary of the place of the coronation. 3. Bestowal of the sacred rel relics, artifacts, or other objects at the time of coronation. 4. Anointing. Quote, In addition, the ideal was that the new king take office before the death of the old one, and this transfer of power was connected with the ceremony where the people make or renew their covenant with God. End quote from Ricks in re Rediscovering the Book of Mormon. This took place a little later with King Benjamin's people when they proclaimed, We are willing to enter into a covenant with our God, to do his will, and to be obedient to his commandments. From the scriptures. And moreover, I shall give this people a name, that thereby they, they may be distinguished above all the people which the Lord God hath brought out of the land of Jerusalem. And this I do, because they have been a diligent people in keeping the commandments of the Lord. And I give unto them a name that never shall be blotted out, except it be through transgression. transgression. From the manual, Mosiah 1, 11 through 12. The name King Benjamin wanted to give his people. The major purpose for King Benjamin to gather his people together was to give them a name. He wanted to lift them spiritually. He and many other holy prophets had spent years preaching to the people and preparing them to be spiritually ready to take upon them the name of Christ. Throughout his address, King Benjamin spoke of how to worthily accept the name he desired to give them. Then, in Mosiah 5, verses 8-11, through 11, he clearly identified the name of as being that 
of Jesus Christ. From the scriptures, Yea, and moreover I say unto you, that if this highly favored people of the Lord should fall into transgression, and become a wicked and, adul and an adulterous people, that the Lord will deliver them up, that thereby they become weak like unto their brethren, and he will no more preserve them by his matchless and marvelous power, as he has hitherto preserved our fathers. For I say unto you, that if he had not extended his arm in the preservation of our fathers, they must have fallen into the hands of the Lamanites, and become victims to their hatred. And it came to pass that after King Benjamin had made an end of these sayings to his son, that he gave them, him charge concerning all the affairs of the kingdom, and moreover he also gave him charge concerning the records which were engraven on the plates of brass, and also the plates of Nephi, and also the sword of Laban, and the ball, or director, which led our fathers through the wilderness, which, which, which was prepared by the hand of the Lord, that thereby they might be led, every one according to the heat and diligence which they gave unto him. Therefore, as they were unfaithful, they did not prosper nor progress in their journey, but were driven back, and incurred the displeasure of God upon them. And therefore they were smitten with famine and sore afflictions to stir them up in remembrance of their duty. And now it came to pass that Mosiah went and did as his father had commanded him, and proclaimed unto all the people who were in the land of Zarahemla that, they, that thereby they might gather themselves together to go up to the temple to hear the words which his father should speak unto them. From the Manual, Mosiah 1, verses 11 through 18, a name for King Benjamin's people. King Benjamin spoke of giving his people a name to distinguish them above all the people which the Lord God hath brought out of the land of Jerusalem, a name that would never be blotted out except it be through transgression. What was the name King Benjamin wanted to give his people? From the Scriptures, chapter 2, King Benjamin addresses his people. He recounts the equity, fairness, and spirituality of his reign. He counsels them to serve their heavenly king. Those who rebel against God will suffer anguish like unquenchable fire, about 124 BC. And it came to pass that after Mosiah had done as his father had commanded him, and had made a proclamation throughout all the land, that the people gathered themselves together throughout all the land, that they might go up to the temple to hear the words which King Benjamin should speak unto them. And there were a great number, even so many, that they did not number them, for they had multiplied exceedingly and waxed great in the land. And they also took of the firstlings of their flock, that they might offer sacrifice and burnt offerings according to the law of Moses, and also that they might give thanks to the Lord their God, who had brought them out of the land of Jerusalem, and who had delivered them out of the hands of their enemies, and had appointed just men to be their teachers, and also a just man to be their king, who had established peace in the land of Zarahemla, and who had taught them to keep the commandments of God, that they might rejoice and be filled with love towards God and all and all men. And it came to pass that when they came up to the temple, they pitched their tents round about, every man according to his family, consisting of his wife and his sons and his daughters, and their sons and their daughters, from the eldest down to the youngest, every family being separate one from another. And they pitched their tents round about the temple, every man having his tent with the door to thereof towards the temple, that thereby they might remain in their tents and hear the words which King Benjamin should speak unto them. For the multitude being so great that King Benjamin could not teach them all within the walls of the temple, therefore he caused a tower to be erected, that thereby his people might hear the words which he should speak unto them. And it came to pass that he began to speak to his people from the tower, and they could not all hear his words because of the greatness of the multitude. Therefore he caused that the words which he spake should be written and sent forth among those that were un not under the sound of his voice, that they might also receive his words. And these are the words which he spake and caused to be written, saying, My brethren, all ye that have assembled yourselves together, you that can hear my words, which I shall speak unto you this day, for I have not commanded you to come up hither to trifle with the words which I shall speak, but that you should hearken unto me, and open your ears that ye may hear, and your hearts that ye may understand, and your minds that the mysteries of God may be unfolded to your view. I have not commanded you to come up hither that ye should fear me, or that ye should think that I of myself am more than a mortal man. But I am like as yourselves, subject to all manner of infirmities in body and mind. Yet I have been chosen by this people, and consecrated by my Father, and was suffered by the hand of the Lord that I should be a ruler and a king over this people, and have been kept and preserved by his matchless power. 
to serve you with all the might, mind, and strength which the Lord hath granted unto me. I say unto you, that as I have been suffered to spend my days in your service, even up to this time, and have not sought gold, nor silver, nor any manner of riches of you, neither have I suffered that ye should be confined in dungeons, nor that ye should make slaves of one of another, nor that ye should murder, or plunder, or steal, or commit adultery, nor even have I suffered that ye should commit any manner of wickedness, and have taught you that ye should keep the commandments of the Lord in all things which he hath commanded you. And even I myself have labored with mine own hands, that I might serve you, and that ye should not be laden with taxes, and there should nothing come upon you which was grievous to be borne. And of all these things which I have spoken, ye yourselves are witnesses this day. Yet, my brethren, I have not done these things that I might boast, neither do I tell these things that thereby I might accuse you. But I tell you these things that ye may know that I can answer a clear conscience before God this day. Behold, I say unto you, that because I said unto you that I had spent my life, or spent my days in your service, I do not desire to boast, for I have only been in the service of God. And behold, I tell you these things, that ye may learn wisdom, that ye may learn that when ye are in the service of your fellow beings, ye are only in the service of your God. From the Come Follow Me manual, Mosiah 2.17 Might be a good, Mosiah 2.17 might be a good verse, for your children to learn. You could help them repeat it a few words at a time, or you could write the verse down with several key words missing and ask your children to find the missing words. Then you could talk with your children about why God wants us to serve each other. From this, um, from the manual, Mosiah 2.17, Learn Wisdom. King Benjamin's comment about service to fellow men suggests in beautiful simplicity the doctrine taught by the Savior, inasmuch as ye have done it unto one of the least of these, my brethren, ye have done it unto me. Regarding service to others, Elder Antoine R. Ivins said, quote, The great value, I believe, that the church has for us is the opportunity it gives us to serve, for after all, the great benefits of life come from service. Generous, open-hearted, full service to our fellows— I believe, is the thing which brings us the greatest happiness. We can serve our families and gain happiness by it. We can serve our friends and gain happiness by it. But if we would be happy, we must serve and serve generously. And I believe myself that the greatest happiness that comes to me from observing the standards of the church and meeting my obligations to it is the spiritual values that I get out of that service. I would like to be able to say that I always serve for the sheer love of service. I don't know whether I can honestly say that or not, but I hope I can. I would like to suggest that all of us who serve, serve for the same motive, out of sheer joy and love of service. I would that every man who accepts a responsibility in a priesthood quorum <clears throat> would accept it because of the opportunity for service which it offers him. Not that he be a good deacon so, so, that, so he may be the president of his quorum. Not that he be a good priest, that some day he may be made president of the elders quorum. Not to be a good bishop, that when the stake is reorganized, he may become the president of the stake. Because if he serves with that motive, there is very likely to be a day of disappointment for him. But if he serves because he loves to, if he serves because he loves his fellows, then whether the other things come or not, he is never disappointed. End quote. Mosiah 2.17, Service. President Howard W. Hunter taught that righteousness should be at the heart of all service we give. Quote, Continue to seek opportunities for service. Don't be overly concerned with status. It is important to be appreciated, but our focus should be on righteousness, not recognition, on service, not status. The faithful visiting teacher who quietly goes about her work month after month is just as important to the work of the Lord as those who occupy what some see as more prominent positions in the church. Visibility does not equate to value, end quote. Elder Robert J. Wetton of the Seventy explained how the service we render to others can be used to measure the depth of our own personal conversion. Quote, conversion means consecrating your life to caring for and serving others who need your help and sharing your gifts and blessings. Every unselfish act of kindness and service increases your spirituality God would use you to bless others. Your continued spiritual growth and eternal progress are very much wrapped up in your relationships, in how you treat others, 
Do you indeed love others and become a blessing in their lives? Isn't the measure of the level of your conversion how you treat others? The person who does only those things in the church that concern himself alone will never reach the goal of perfection. Service to others is what the gospel and exalted life are all about. End quote. Other Dallin H. Oaks of the Quorum of the Twelve Apostles helped us understand that in addition to what service we do, it is very important why we do it. Quote, the last motive is, in my opinion, the highest reason of all, in its relationship to service, is what the scriptures call a more excellent way. If our service is to be most efficacious, it must be accomplished for the love of God and the love of his children, end quote. From the scriptures, Behold, ye have called me your king, and if I, whom ye call your king, do labor to serve you, then ought not ye to labor to serve one another? From the Come Follow Me Manual, Mosiah 2, verses 11 through 18. When I serve others, I am serving God. This week's activity page has a simple crown your children could make. Maybe they would like to take turns standing on a chair or stool and pretending to be King Benjamin while you share some things King Benjamin taught his people, found in Mosiah 2 through 3. You could also share with them chapter 12, King Benjamin from the Book of Mormon Stories, to give them an overview of King Benjamin's teachings. You could help your children search Mosiah 2, 11 through 18, to find out what King Benjamin did to serve others. Then your children could write on strips of paper some ways they can serve family members. Put the papers in a container, like a bag or jar, so your children can pick one each day and do that act of service for someone. From the Student Manual, Mosiah 2, verses 9 through 18, A Clear Conscience Before God. In Mosiah 2, 9 through 18, King Benjamin briefly reported his stewardship to the Nephites. His words lead to pondering on how few political leaders in the history of the world could stand before their people and say, quote, I can answer a clear conscience before God this day. End quote. King Benjamin's son, Mosiah, another great prophet king, later said, If ye could have men for your kings who would do even as my father Benjamin did for this people, I say unto you, if this could always be the case, then it would be expedient that ye should always have kings to rule over you. From the scriptures. And behold also, if I, whom ye call your king, who has spent his days in your service, and yet has been in the service of God, do merit any thanks from you, oh, how you ought to thank your heavenly king. I say unto you, my brethren, that if you should render all the thanks and praise which your whole soul has power to possess, to that God who has created you, and has kept and preserved you, and has caused that ye should rejoice, and has granted that ye should live in peace one with another. I say unto you that if ye should serve him who has created you from the beginning, and is preserving you from day to day, by lending you breath, that ye may live and move and do according to your own will, and even supporting you from one moment to another, I say if ye should serve him with all your whole souls, yet ye would be unprofitable servants." And behold, all that he requires of you is to keep his commandments, and he has promised you that if ye would keep his commandments, ye should prosper in the land. And he never doth vary from that which he hath said. Therefore, if ye do keep his commandments, he doth bless you and prosper you. And now, in the first place, he hath created you, and granted unto you your lives, for which ye are indebted unto him. And secondly, he doth require that ye should do as he hath commanded you, for which if ye do, he doth immediately bless you, and therefore he hath paid you, and ye are still indebted unto him, and are, and will be for ever and ever. Therefore, of what have ye to From the manual, Mosiah 2, 24, Indebted unto him. I believe that one of the greatest sins of which the inhabitants of the earth are guilty today is the sin of ingratitude. The want of acknowledgement on their part of God and his right to govern and control. We see a man raised up with extraordinary gifts or with great intelligence, and he is instrumental in developing some great principle. He and the world ascribe his great genius and wisdom to himself. He at attributes his success to his own energies, labor, and mental capacity. He does not acknowledge the hand of God in anything connected with his success but ignores him altogether and takes the honor to himself. 
This will apply to almost all the world. In all the great modern discoveries in science, in the arts, in mechanics, and in all material advancement of the age, the world says, we have done it. The individual says, I have done it. And he gives no honor or credit to God. Now I read, read in the revelations through Joseph Smith, the prophet, that because of this, God is not pleased with the inhabitants of the earth, but is angry with them because they will not accept, acknowledge his hand in all things, end quote, by Joseph F. Smith. Quote, we are not our own. We are, brought, we are bought with a price. We are the Lord's. Our time, our talents, our gold and silver, our wheat and fine flour, our wine and our oil and our cattle, and all there is on this earth that we have in our possession is the Lord's. There is no man who ever made a sacrifice on this earth for the kingdom of heaven that I know anything about except the Savior. He drank the bitter cup to the dregs and tasted for every man and for every woman and redeemed the earth and all things upon it. But he was God in the flesh, or he could not have endured it. But we suffer, we sacrifice, we give something we have preached so long. What for? Why? For the Lord. I would not give the ashes of a rye, of a rye straw for the man who feels that he is making sacrifice for God. We are doing this for our own happiness, welfare, and exaltation, and for nobody else's. This is the fact. And what we do, we do for the salvation of the inhabitants of the earth, not for the salvation of the heavens, the angels, or the gods. End quote by Brigham Young. From the scriptures. And now I ask, can ye say aught of yourselves? I answer you, nay. Ye cannot say that ye are even as much as the dust of the earth. Yet ye were created of the dust of the earth. But behold, it belongeth to him who created you. From the student manual. Mosiah 2.25, your body belongeth to him who created you. Mosiah 2.25 is the Lord's response to those who claim that, quote, it's my body and I can do what I want with it, end quote. King Benjamin's point that our bodies belong to God is consistent with the teachings of Paul when he wrote, for ye are bought with a price, therefore glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. From the Come Follow Me manual, Mosiah 2, verses 19 through 25. All of my blessings come from Heavenly Father. King Benjamin's service to his people was inspired by his deep gratitude to God. How will you inspire similar feelings in your children? You could read together Mosiah 2, 21 and start a list of blessings Heavenly Father has given us. Then maybe you could add to the list other blessings your children think of. Here's a game you could play to help your children recognize Heavenly Father's blessings. The children could pass around a picture of the Savior as they sing or listen to a song about gratitude. Stop singing or stop the music periodically and invite whoever is holding the picture to talk about a blessing they are grateful for. According to Mosiah 2, verses 22 through 24, how can we show that we are thankful for our blessings? From the scriptures, And I, even I, whom ye call your king, am no better than ye yourselves are, for I am also of the dust, and ye behold that I am old, and am about to yield up this mortal frame to its mother earth. From the Come Follow Me Manual. When I serve others, I am also serving God. What do you think King Benjamin would say if you asked him why he served with all his might, mind, and strength? Ponder this as you read Mosiah 2, verses 10 through 26. What did King Benjamin teach that inspires you to serve others in a more meaningful way? For example, what does it mean to you to know that when you serve other people, you are also serving God? Seek inspiration about how you can serve someone this week. Even when we know how we should serve others, we sometimes face challenges. Another way to study Mosiah 2, verses 10 through 26, is to make a list of truths King Benjamin taught that, we, that can help you overcome the challenges that might keep you from serving. What experiences have shown you that what King Benjamin taught is true? President jo Joy D. Jones shared a powerful experience that changed the way she looked at serving others. Read about it in For Him in the Ensign Early Ahona, November 2018. And think about the opportunities you have to serve others. You might even list a few and ponder how President Jones' message, along with Mosiah 2.17,
might influence the way you approach these opportunities. A hymn such as A Poor Wayfaring Man of Grief, or a video like The Old Shoemaker in the Gospel Library might help you think of additional insights. See also Matthew 25 Bordy and Faith's Murray story, Overcoming Adversity Through Service, and King Benjamin teaches about serving God in videos in the Gospel Library. From the Scriptures, Therefore, as I said unto you, that I had served you, walking with a clear conscience before God, even so I at this time have caused that ye should assemble yourselves together, that I might be found blameless, and that your blood should not come upon me, when I shall stand to be judged of God, of the things whereof he hath commanded me concerning you. I say unto you that I have caused that ye should assemble yourselves together, that I might rid my garments of your blood. At this period of time, when I am about to go down to my grave, that I might go down in peace, and my immortal, immortal spirit may join the choirs above in singing the praises of a just God. And moreover, I say unto you that I have caused that ye should assemble yourselves together, that I might declare unto you that I can no longer be your teacher nor your king. For even at this time my whole frame doth tremble exceedingly while attempting to speak unto you. But the Lord God doth support me, and hath suffered me that I should speak unto you, and hath commanded me that I should declare unto you this day that my son Mosiah is a king and a ruler over you. And now, my brethren, I would that ye should do as ye have hitherto done, as ye have kept my commandments, and also the commandments of my father, and have prospered, and have been kept from falling into the hands of your enemies. Even so, if ye shall keep the commandments of my Son, or the commandments of God, which shall be delivered unto you by him, ye shall prosper in the land, and your enemies shall have no power over you. But, O my people, beware, lest there shall arise contentions among you, <clears throat> and ye list to obey the evil spirit which was spoken of by my father, Mosiah. From the Manual Mosiah 2, 27-32, not accountable for the sins of the Nephites. The prophets are among the most effective in using symbolism. King Benjamin's comment about his people's blood not coming upon him is a metaphor for his not being held accountable for the behavior of his people. Since he had taught them, of, taught them all of the things that the Lord required of him, his allegorical statement about the choirs in heaven is another example of revealed spiritual truths King Benjamin longed to be among those who, after their mortal probation, could by deed and by word praise God in a heavenly anthem. From the Scriptures For behold, there is a woe pronounced upon him who listeth to obey that spirit. For if he listeth to obey him, and remaineth and dieth in his sins, the same drinketh the damnation to his own soul. For he receiveth for his wages an everlasting punishment having transgressed the law of God, contrary to his own knowledge. I say unto you that there are not any among you, except it be your little children, that have not been taught concerning these things. But what knoweth that ye are eternally indebted to your heavenly Father, to render to him all that you have and are, and also have been taught concerning the records which contain the prophecies, which have been spoken by the holy prophets, even down to the time our father Lehi left Jerusalem. From the Student Manual, Mosiah 2, verses 21 through 24, and verse 34, indebted unto him, Elder Joseph B. Worthlin of the Quorum of the Twelve Apostles taught that we should spend all our days in pursuit of eternal life as a means of showing gratitude for the debt Jesus Christ paid on our behalf. Quote, How can we ever repay the debt we owe to the Savior? He paid a debt he did not owe us to, f he did not owe to free us from a debt we can never pay. Because of him we will live forever. Because of his infinite atonement, our sins can be swept away, allowing us to experience the greatest of all the gifts of God, eternal life. Can such a gift have a price? Can we ever make, a compens make compensation for such a gift? The Book of Mormon prophet King Benjamin taught that if you should render all the thanks and praise which your whole soul has power to possess and serve him with all your whole souls, yet ye would be unprofitable servants. End quote. One of the best ways for each of us to demonstrate gratitude for what Heavenly Father and Jesus Christ give us is to keep the commandments. President Joseph Fielding Smith taught, quote, We are extremely ungrateful to our Father and to his beloved Son 
when in all humility, with broken hearts and contrite spirits, we are unwilling to keep the commandments. The violation of any divine commandment is a most ungrateful act, considering all that has been accomplished for us through the atonement of our Savior. We will never be able to pay the debt. The gratitude of our hearts should be filled to overflowing in love and obedience for his great tender, great and tender mercy. For what he has done, we should never fail him. He bought us with a price, the price of his great suffering and the spilling of his blood in sacrifice on the cross. Now he has asked us to keep his commandments. He says they are not grievous, and there, there are so many of us who are not willing to do it. I am speaking now generally of the people on the earth. We are not willing to do it. That certainly is ingratitude. We are ungrateful. Every member of this church who violates the Sabbath day, who is not honest in the paying of his tithing, who will not keep the word of wisdom, who willfully violates any of the other commandments the Lord has given us, is ungrateful to the Son of God. And when ungrateful to the Son of God, is ungrateful to the Father who sent him, end quote. From the scriptures. And also, all that has been spoken by our fathers until now, and behold, also, they spake that which was commanded them of the Lord. Therefore, they are just and true. And now I say unto you, my brethren, that after ye have known and have been taught all these things, if ye should transgress and go contrary to that which has been spoken, that ye do withdraw yourselves from the Spirit of the Lord, that it may have no place in you to guide you in wisdom's paths, that ye may be blessed, prospered, and preserved. I say unto you that the man that doeth this, the same cometh out in open rebellion against God, Therefore he listeth to obey the evil spirit, and becometh an enemy to all righteousness. Therefore the Lord has no place in him, for he dwelleth not in unholy temples. Therefore, if that man repenteth not, and remaineth and dieth an enemy to God, the demands of divine justice do awaken his immortal soul to a lively sense of his own guilt, which doth cause him to shrink from the presence of the Lord, and doth fill his breast with guilt and pain and anguish, which is like an unquenchable fire, whose flame ascendeth up for ever and ever. From the Student Manual. Mosiah 2.38, Eternal Punishment. Eternal punishment or endless punishment does not mean that those who partake of it must endure it forever. It is not written that there shall be no end to this torment, but it is written endless torment. Again, it is written eternal damnation. Wherefore, it is more expressed than other scriptures, that it might work upon the hearts of the children of men altogether for my name's glory. Behold the mystery of godliness, how great it is. For behold, I am endless, and the punishment which is given from my hand is endless punishment, for endless is my name. Wherefore, endless punishment is God's punishment. Endless punishment is God's punishment. Or eternal punishment is God's punishment. The laws are immutable, and from this explanation, we learn that the same punishment always follows the same offense, according to the laws of God, who is eternal and endless. Hence, it is called endless punishment, an eternal punishment, because it is the punishment which God has affixed according to the to unchangeable law. A man may partake of endless tor torment, and when he has paid the penalty for his transgression, he is released. But the punishment remains and awaits the next culprit, and so on forever. From Joseph Fielding Smith. From the Scriptures. And now I say unto you, that mercy hath no claim on that man. Therefore his final doom is to endure a never-ending torment. O all ye old men, and also ye young men, and you, ye little children who can understand my words, for I have spoken plainly unto you that ye might understand. I pray that ye should awake to a remembrance of the awful situation of those that have fallen into transgression. And moreover, I would desire that you should consider on the blessed and happy state of those that keep the commandments of God. For behold, they are blessed in all things, both temporal and spiritual. And if they hold out faithful to the end, they are received into heaven, that thereby they may dwell with God in a state of never-ending happiness. Oh, remember, remember that these things are true, for the Lord God hath spoken it. From the student manual, Mosiah 2, verses 34 through 41, Consequences of Sin. King Benjamin clearly defined the consequences of sin. When a person knows what is right and does not do it, he not only violates the actual law, but also puts himself in a state of opposition to God. This person becomes an enemy to all righteousness, one of the problems of the natural man. The testimony of King Benjamin and of all the prophets is that one re really serves himself as he serves the Lord. 
Sin leads to misery, suffering, and loss of agency. Mosiah 2, verses 34 through 41, willfully rebelling against God. When a person knows what is right and does not do it, he or she not only violates the actual law, but puts himself or herself in a state of opposition to God. A serious offense in and of itself. President Gordon B. Hinckley shared the following simple illustration of such rebellion. Quote, I recall a bishop, a bishop telling me of a woman who came to get a recommend. When asked if she observed the word of wisdom, she said that she occasionally drank a cup of coffee. She said, <clears throat> No, bishop, you're not going to let that keep me from going to the temple, are you? To which he replied, Sister, surely you will not let a cup of coffee stand between you and the house of the Lord. End quote. From Come Follow Me, Mosiah 2, verses 38 through 41. Happiness comes from keeping the commandments of God. How would you describe the happiness that comes from obedience to God? Are there any phrases in Mosiah 2, 38 through 41 that would help you explain why you keep his commandments? From the scriptures, chapter 3. King Benjamin continues his address. The Lord Omnipotent will minister among men in the tabernacle of clay. Blood will come from every poor as he atones for the sins of the world. He is not. He is the only name whereby salvation comes. Men can put off the natural man and become saints through the atonement. The torment of the wicked will be as a lake of fire and brimstone. About 124 BC. And again, my brethren, I would call your attention, for I have somewhat more to speak unto you. For behold, I have things to tell you concerning that which is to come. And the things which I tell you are made known unto me by an angel from God. And he said unto me, Awake, and I awoke. And behold, he stood before me. And he said unto me, Awake, and hear the words which I shall tell thee. For behold, I am come to declare unto you the glad tidings of great joy. For the Lord hath heard the, thy prayers, and hath judged of thy righteousness, and hath sent me to declare unto thee that thou mayest rejoice, and that thou mayest declare unto the, thy people, that they may also be filled with joy. For behold, the time cometh, and is not far distant, that with power the Lord Omnipotent who reigneth, who was and is from all eternity to all eternity, shall come down from heaven among the children of men, and shall dwell in a tabernacle of clay, and shall go forth amongst men, working mighty miracles, such as healing the sick, raising the dead, causing the lame to walk, the blind to receive their sight, and the deaf to hear, and curing all manner of diseases. And he shall cast out devils, or the evil spirits which dwell in the hearts of the children of men. And lo, he shall suffer temptations, and pain of body, hunger, thirst, and fatigue, even more than any man can suffer, except it be unto death. For behold, blood cometh from every poor, so great shall be his anguish for the wickedness and the abominations of his people. From the Student Manual, Mosiah 3, verse 7. So great was his anguish. Elder Neil A. Maxwell of the Quorum of the Twelve Apostles referred to the suffering experienced by Jesus Christ as the awful arithmetic of the atonement. Quote, Imagine Jehovah the creator of this and other worlds, astonished. Jesus knew cognitively what he must do, but not experientially. He had never personally known the exquisite and the exacting process of an atonement before. Thus, when the agony came in its fullness, it was so much, much worse than even he, with his unique intellect, had ever imagined. No wonder an angel appeared to strengthen him. The cumulative weight of all mortal sins, past, present, and future, pressed upon that perfect, sinless, and sensitive soul. All of our infirmities and sicknesses were somehow, too, a part of the awful arithmetic of the atonement. The anguished Jesus not only pled with the Father that the hour and cup might pass from him, but with this relevant citation, he said, Abba, Father, all things are possible unto thee. Take away this cup from me. Had not Jesus, as Jehovah said to Abraham, is anything too hard for the Lord? Had not his angel told a perplexed Mary, for with God nothing shall be impossible? Jesus' request was not theater. In his extremity, he did he, perchance, hope for a rescuing ram in the thicket? I do not know. His suffering, as it were, enormity multiplied by infinity, evoked his later soul cry on the cross. 
and it was a cry of forsakeness. Even so, Jesus maintained this sublime submissiveness as he had in Gethsemane. Nevertheless, not as thy will, as I will, but as thou wilt. End quote. One commentator wrote that the Savior's suffering was the total weight of the consequence of the fall. Quote, Jesus knew that the awful hour of his deepest humiliation had arrived, that from this moment till the utterance of that great cry with which he expired, Nothing remained for him on earth but the torture of physical pain and the poignancy of mental anguish. All that the human frame can tolerate of suffering was to be heaped upon his shrinking body. Every misery that cruel and crushing insult can inflict was to weigh heavily, heavy upon his soul. And in his this torment of body and agony of soul, even the high and radiant serenity of his divine spirit was to suffer a short but terrible eclipse. Pain in its acutest sting Shame in its most overwhelming brutality, all the burden of the sin and mystery of man's existence in its apostasy and fall. This was what he must now face in all its most inexplicable accumulation. End quote. From the scriptures. And he shall be called Jesus Christ, the Son of God, the Father of heaven and earth, the creator of all things from the beginning. And his mother shall be called Mary. And lo, he cometh unto his own, that salvation might come unto the children of men, even through faith on his name. And even after all this they shall consider him a man, and say that he hath a devil, and shall scourge him and crucify him. And he shall rise the third day from the dead. And behold, he standeth to judge the world. And behold, all these things are done, that a righteous judgment might come upon the children of men. For behold, and also his blood atoneth for the sins of those who have fallen by the transgression of Adam, who have died not knowing the will of God concerning them, or who have ignorantly sinned. But woe, woe unto him who knoweth that he rebelleth against God. For salvation cometh to none such except it be through repentance and faith on the Lord Jesus Christ. And the Lord God has sent his holy prophets among all the children of men to declare these things to every kindred, nation, and tongue, that thereby whosoever should believe that Christ should come, the same might receive a remission of their sins and rejoice with exceeding, exceedingly great joy, even as though he had already come among them. Yet the Lord God saw that his people were a stiff-necked people, and he appointed unto them a law, even the law of Moses. And many signs and wonders and types and shadows showed he unto them concerning his coming, and also holy prophets spake unto them concerning his coming. And yet they hardened their hearts, and understood not that the law of Moses availeth nothing, except it were through the atonement of his blood." And even if it were possible that little children could sin, they could not be saved. But I say unto you, they are blessed, for behold, as in Adam, or by nature, they fall, even so the blood of Christ atoneth for their sins. And moreover, I say unto you, that there shall be no other name given, nor any other way, nor means whereby salvation can come unto the children of men, only in and through the name of Christ the Lord Omnipotent. From the Student Manual Mosiah 3, verse 17, no other name given. The first presidency in the Quorum of the Twelve Apostles affirmed that salvation comes through Jesus Christ. Quote, we bear testimony as his duly ordained apostles that Jesus is the living Christ, the immortal Son of God. He is the great King Emmanuel, who stands today on the right hand of his Father. He is the light, the life, and the hope of the world. He is the way. His way is the path that leads to happiness in this life and eternal life in the world to come. End quote. From the scriptures, for behold, he judgeth, and his judgment is just, and the infant perisheth not that dieth in his infancy. But men drink damnation to their own souls, except they humble themselves and become as little children, and believe that salvation was and is, and is to come in and through the atoning blood of the of Christ the Lord omnipotent. From the student manual, Mosiah three verse five and verses 17 and 18. What does, the ter what does the term Lord Omnipotent mean? Of all the prophets recorded in the Book of Mormon, King Benjamin is the only one to use the term Omnipotent, which Elder Bruce R. McConkie of the Quorum of the Twelve Apostles defined this way. Quote, Christ is the Lord Omnipotent, meaning that as Lord of all, he has all power. End quote. From the Scriptures. For the natural man is an enemy to God, and has been from the fall of Adam, and will be, forever and ever, unless he yields to the enticings of the Holy Spirit. 
and putteth off the natural man, and becometh a saint through the atonement of Christ the Lord, and becometh as a child, submissive, meek, humble, patient, full of love, willing to submit to all things which the Lord seeth fit to inflict upon him, even as a child that submit to his father. From the Student Manual, Mosiah 3.19, The Natural Man. The word natural, when applied to man, is used differently in the scriptures than it is by the world. Usually, natural, or by nature, indicates an inherent part of our makeup, something we are born with. The scriptures, however, clearly teach that natural man means fallen or sinful man. Though born innocent, all men, through the fall of Adam, are born into a fallen world, knowing good and evil, and living in this imperfect state, all men sin, and experience a resultant fall and spiritual death. In other words, it is through transgression of God's law that one becomes a natural man. Hence, a natural man is an enemy to God until he qualifies for the cleansing influence of the atonement by living the commandments of God. Man then becomes a new creature, being born again and becoming spiritually alive, and worthy to be known as a friend of God. Mosiah 3.19, The Natural Man King Benjamin taught that to put off the natural man we must yield to the enticings of the Holy Spirit, In a conference address, Elder Neil A. Maxwell discussed how he might accomplish this task. Quote, Personal righteousness, worship, prayer, and scripture study are so crucial in order to put off the natural man. In an earlier address, Elder Maxwell suggested another tool, along with a caution, for putting off the natural man. Quote, Hope is particularly needed in the hand-to-hand combat required to put off the natural man. Giving up on God and on oneself constitutes simultaneous surrender to the natural man. End quote. Mosiah 3.19, Becoming a Saint. While discussing what it means to be a saint, Elder Quentin L. Cook of the Quorum of the Twelve Apostles cited this definition and then provided examples of things we must separate ourselves from. Quote, the word saint in Greek denotes set apart, separate, and holy. If we are able, or if we are to be saints in our day, we need to separate ourselves from evil conduct and destructive pursuits that are prevalent in the world. We are bombarded with visual images of violence and immorality. Inappropriate music and pornography are increasingly tolerated. The use of drugs and alcohol is rampant. There is less emphasis on honesty and character. Individual rights are demanded, but duties, responsibilities, and obligations are neglected. There has been a coercing of dialogue, a coarsening of dialogue, and increased exposure to that which is base and vulgar. The adversary has been relentless in his efforts to undermine the plan of happiness. If we separate ourselves from this worldly conduct, we will have the spirit in our lives and experience the joy of being worthy Latter-day Saints. Mosiah 3.19, As a Child President Henry B. Eyring of the First Presidency taught how becoming as a child leads to spiritual safety. King Benjamin makes it clear how we can have our natures changed through the atonement of Jesus Christ. That is the only way we can build on the sure foundation and so stand firm in righteousness during the storms of temptation. King Benjamin describes that change with a beautiful comparison used by prophets for millennia and by the Lord himself. It is this, that we can and we must become as a child, a little child. For some that will not be easy to understand or to accept, most of us want to be strong. We may well see being like a child as being weak. But King Benjamin, who understood, as well as any mortal, what it meant to be a man of strength and courage, makes it clear that to be like a child is not to be childish, it is to be like the Savior who prayed to his Father for strength to be able to do his will and then did it. Our natures must be changed to become as a child to gain that strength we must have to be safe in times of moral peril. We are safe on the rock which is the Savior when we have yielded in faith in him, have responded to the Holy Spirit's direction to keep the commandments long enough and faithfully enough that the power of the atonement has changed our hearts. When we have, by that experience, become as a child in our capacity to love and obey, we are on the sure foundation. From King Benjamin, we learn what we can do to take us to that safe place. But remember, the things we, are, we do are the means, not the ends we seek. What we do follows the atonement of Jesus Christ to change us into what we must be. Our faith in Jesus Christ brings us to repentance and to keeping his commandments. We obey and we resist temptation by following the promptings of the Holy Ghost. In time, our natures will change. 
we will become as a little child, obedient to God and more loving. That change, if we do all we must to keep it, will qualify us to enjoy the gifts which come through the Holy Ghost. Then we will be safe on the only sure rock, end quote. From Come Follow Me, Mosiah 3, verses 5 through 10 and verse 19. Jesus Christ will help me become more like him. An angel told King Benjamin important truths about the life and ministry of Jesus Christ. Maybe you and your children could look for pictures of some events mentioned in Mosiah 3, verses 5 through 10. As you read Mosiah 3, 5 through 10, your children could raise their hands when they hear something in the passages that appears in one of the pictures. Have your children ever helped prepare food using a recipe? Maybe you could talk about that experience and use Mosiah 319 to come up with a recipe for how we can become like Jesus Christ. How does Jesus help us become like him? I'm from the scriptures. And moreover, I say unto you that the time shall come when the knowledge of a Savior shall spread throughout every nation, kindred, tongue, and people. From Come Follow Me, Mosiah 3, verses 1 through 20. I can become a saint through the atonement of Jesus Christ. King Benjamin, like all prophets, testified of Jesus Christ so that his people might receive remission of their sins and rejoice with exceedingly great joy. Here are some questions to ponder as you read King Benjamin's testimony of the Savior in Mosiah 3, 1 through 20. What do I learn from these verses about the Savior and his mission? What do I learn from Mosiah 3, 18 through 19 about what it means to become a saint? How has Jesus Christ helped me overcome sin, change my heart, and become more like a saint. From the scriptures, And behold, when that time cometh, none shall be found blameless before God, except it be little children, only through repentance and faith on the name of the Lord God Omnipotent. From the Come Follow Me Manual, Mosiah 3, 5-21 through The Lord Omnipotent shall come down from heaven. What does electrical power give you the ability to do? How would your life be different without it? These questions could help you ponder the even greater power that the Savior can bring into your life. The angel who appeared to King Benjamin referred to Jesus Christ as the Lord Omnipotent, a title that means he has all power. What do you learn from Mosiah 3, 5 through 21 about how the Savior uses this power? How have you seen the Savior's power in your life and in the lives of the people around you? What does his power enable you to do and to become? How would your life be different without it? From the scriptures. And even at this time, when thou shalt have taught thy people the things which the Lord thy God hath commanded thee, even then are they found no more blameless in the sight of God, only according to the words which I have spoken unto thee. And now I have spoken the words which the Lord God hath commanded me. And thus saith the Lord, They shall stand as a bright testimony against this people at the judgment day. Wherefore they shall be judged, whereof they shall be judged, every man according to his works, whether they be good or whether they be evil. And if they be evil, they are consigned to an awful view of their own guilt and abominations, which doth cause them to shrink from the presence of the Lord into a state of misery and endless torment, from whence they can no more return. Therefore they have drunk damnation to their own souls. Therefore they have drunk out of the cup of the wrath of God which justice could no more deny unto them than it could deny that Adam should fall because of his partaking of the forbidden fruit. Therefore, mercy could have claim on them no more forever. And their torment is as a lake of fire and brimstone, whose flames are unquenchable, and whose smoke ascendeth up forever and ever. Thus hath the Lord commanded me. Amen.